Welcome back to Beyond the Patterns. So today I have the great pleasure to announce Professor Dr. Matthias Niesner, who is a professor at the Technical University of Munich and leads the Visual Computing Lab. Before, he was a visiting assistant professor at Stanford University. Professor Niesner's research lies at the intersection of computer vision, graphics, machine learning, and is particularly interested in cutting-edge techniques for 3D reconstruction, semantic 3D scene understanding, video editing, and AI-driven video synthesis. In total, he has published over 70 academic publications, including 22 papers at prestigious ACM Transactions on Graphics, SIGGRAPH, SIGGRAPH Asia Journal, and 24 works at the leading vision conferences, CVPR, ECCV, ICCV. Several of these works won best paper awards, including SIG Chai 2014, HPG 15, SPG 18 and the SIGGRAPH 16 Emerging Technologies Award for the best live demo. Professor Niesner's work enjoys wide media coverage with many articles featured in mainstream media, including the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Spiegel, MIT Technological Review, and many more, and his work led to several TV appearances, such as on Jimmy Kimmel Live, where Professor Niesner demonstrated the popular face-to-face -face technique. Professor Niesner's academic YouTube channel has over 5 million views. For his work, Professor Niesner received several awards. He is a TUM IAS Rudolf Moosbauer Fellow since 2017. He won the Google Faculty Award for Machine Perception in 2017, the NVIDIA Professor Partnership Award in 2018, as well as the prestigious ERC Starting Grant in 2018, which comes with 1.5 million euro in research funding. In 2019, he received the Eurographics Young Researcher Award, honoring the best upcoming graphics researchers in Europe. In addition to his academic impact, Professor Niesner is a co-founder and director of Synthesia Incorporated, a brand new startup backed by Mark Cuban, whose aim is to empower storytellers with cutting edge AI driven video synthesis. So given his young age, he has quite a few academic and industrial achievements, startups, many, many awards. So I'm very, very much looking forward to his presentation entitled 3D Semantic Scene Understanding. Matthias, thank you for visiting us and the stage is yours. for the kind introduction. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, well, be here is relative, I guess. Um, so as a Franconian, I'm always happy to come back to my roots. Um, I also grew up in Franconia, so this is actually my home. And yeah, it's always fantastic to, to be in Erlangen, which is sadly not the case right now, but I hope, of course, we can continue this in the future again. So in, in this talk, I, I decided to talk a bit about 3D scene understanding and 3D scene generation, specifically of generative tasks um, with neural networks. And I hope, I mean, I'm, 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 of course, I'm aware that many of you are involved in medical imaging. And, I, and of course, Andreas' lab is, is very known for that. Um, but I think a lot of these techniques are actually, they can be probably adapted across domains, right? And I think there's a good opportunity in a sense that probably sharing some expertise from both sides can, can benefit each of the respective domains. Um, when we're talking about 3D scene understanding, we first, of course, have to think about how do we get even 3D data? And there's, of course, many, many ways to get that. And one of the things you can see here is the, one of the first prototypes of the Google car. Um, the Google car is now um, well, transitioned into Waymo, right? Um, and what these guys are doing, they have LiDAR, LiDAR scans. Um, they have these, these fancy scanners on top of it. 
And at the end of the day, they're going to get these point clouds. And from these point clouds, they're doing um, things like object detection, semantic segmentation, and so on. So traditionally speaking, um, I would say in the last decade, we've seen a, a lot of progress on, generally speaking, on deep learning techniques on, on many domains. Um, the first ones were doing these kind of things in an image, right? So you, you basically get an image as input, you run your favorite confnet, um, you're training it with backpropagation, and um, you have, I don't know, whatever architecture, like whatever resonant architecture you, you're choosing, and you can get actually pretty good results by now. Um, the same thing is in, in 3D. Um, in 3D, it's a little bit different, of course. Um, in 3D, we don't just have one image, um, but if you're talking about a 3D scan, and I'm gonna talk about 3D scans in this talk quite a bit. Um, when we're talking about a reconstruction from let's say a Kinect or so, or some range sensor, we're typically gonna get these kind of indoor reconstructions that look like that. So this is a top-down view of, um, of an apartment um, when I was still at Stanford. So here you see a bed, right? Here you see a, a couch, here's a table, um, here are the walls around it and so on. Um, so you see a 3D mesh, um, but it's not quite perfect. It's not like in computer graphics, but it's, um, it has all the spatial um, context in a sense that you have absolute sizes and so on. And in addition to the 3D reconstruction, you're also gonna have the images attached to it. So you're gonna have RGB images, you're gonna have the depth images that were used to create the reconstruction. Um, and based on your reconstruction framework, you're also gonna get the pose alignment of these um, RGBD images. So you know the alignment between these ones here, right? And one of the key ideas, of course, of 3D scene understanding is we ideally want to use all of this data at the same time, right? We just want to use one of, one of these images and run a neural network independently. But ideally, we have this like big end-to-end -end architecture that takes all of these things um, in at the same time. And as output, what we're hoping for is, um, well, semantic instance segmentation is kind of everything, right? So we, we want to detect the objects, we want to assign a class label per object, and we want to be able to figure out to distinguish um, you know, different objects of the same uh, category. So instance segmentation is typically the main task that we, we care about, but, you know, depending on um, what the research goal is, you can break it up into semantic segmentation or detection alone. When we're doing deep learning in 3D, um, and this is a thing that I've been um, talking a lot in my lectures, um, typically you need to get a good representation. And the representation in 3D is a lot, right? I mean, it's very important. You can do deep learning on a mesh, you can do deep learning on a point cloud, um, a very common representation is, however, a simple voxel grid. And even today, this is still working the best for many, many um, tasks here. Um, so one thing you can do is you just have an occupancy grid, also known as a binary grid, right? You just say, oh, is a, vo uh, a voxel occupied or not occupied? Um, and, and then you're running a, a 3D convolution, basically, analog to 2D and 3D. Um, same thing for medical image segmentation, right? Exactly the same thing here for these 3D scans. Um, and you're basically learning the weights of the conf kernels. Um, you can use uh, implicit functions like distance fields, sign distance fields, truncated sign distance fields. Typically, they're also stored in some sort of voxel grid. Um, and also, state of the art methods typically use these kind of representations here as input. Now, one of the things why 3D deep learning has a big advantage over 2D deep learning is you don't have to learn viewpoint invariance. So, if you're having 2D images, right, you basically have to get enough different viewpoint variation in order that the 2D network learns this viewpoint invariance. And th this means that if you train on ImageNet, you need typically tens of millions of images. Whereas if you're training in 3D, you need typically on the order of thousands of scenes, right? So this is a big advantage if you're doing stuff in 3D because the variety is, is, is kind of a lot less and it's much easier to, to learn. Um, by the way, it's an interesting question of how to combine the 2D and 3D things. So that's a, uh, an interesting research area, of course. Um, but yeah, when you when you when you when you're training these networks, um, one challenge you have, of course, also is the scene sizes are typically unknown. So you can have very large environments. A simple thing what you can do for 3D segmentation is you literally just go ahead um, and chunk up the scene into a 62 times 31 times 31 voxel grid. You run a bunch of ResNet blocks in 3D. So this is the conf network, right? Um, and for for the middle column of this chunk, you classify all the voxels and you assign a class to it. In this case, we have 22 classes. We have these 62 voxels in the middle. We're running this network, then we're shifting it by one voxel, we're running it again, and so on. Um, this is one of the dead simplest architectures. This is not state of the art anymore, but this is the simplest concept you can, you can run this kind of stuff on. Um, this, we published this one in 20, uh, 2017. Um, and yeah, it works pretty well. So you can do segmentation with that. Um, you basically get voxel predictions compared to the ground truth that look actually pretty reasonable. 
And one of the things that we have done is not only published a method that was one of the first ones in the space, uh, we also um, published the data around it so people could follow up on these tasks. And this was the this, this scanned data, which is still widely used actually in the community. So by now we have, um, I don't know the exact number, but it's, it's, it's several thousands of groups using it, of course. Um, and we have uh, hundreds of submissions on the benchmark per year. So um, we typically have a benchmark on 3D semantic segmentation. So you see here sparse convolutions doing pretty well right now. Um, and also if you're looking at the numbers here, so we started this very dead simple network that I've just shown you had an IEU of like 0.3 and now the state of the art is already at 0.7. I think this is not even up to date. This is like probably almost 0.8 right now. So in the last two years, we have actually seen massive progress on, on these tasks. So this was for 3D segmentation and, and very similar for 3D instance segmentation, what I mentioned before. We've also seen like, you know, early methods like 0.1, um, in this case, we're measuring average precision. Um, and it, it's like at 0 0.6, 0 0.7 or so right now in terms of state of the art. So we, we've seen quite a lot of progress on these, um, yeah, semantic scene understanding tasks. And it's not a solved problem yet. It's still an interesting question of, you know, what representations you're using and so on. Um, we are also looking at the moment of future learning, like trying to figure out how can we train with as little as possible data and generalize across tasks. Um, so it's a, it's a pretty interesting, it's an in interesting question of, you know, how to, how to make these things still practical and still probably boost the performance a bit. Um, and yeah, the exciting thing is this is all just happening in the last two years, right? There's a lot of, a lot of stuff happening. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is not just the understanding side though, but also what about the generative tasks? And in this case, you know, what we've seen with ScanNet and these kind of um, semantic scene understanding benchmarks mostly give me scene as input and, and tell me um, what's in the scene. And these reconstructions that we're having um, typically look like these ones. Um, we have a 3D mesh here. Um, and these meshes, if you carefully scan them, with this is scanned with a, with a Kinect style sensor. Um, if you scan this, it looks actually pretty decent if you're choosing the right viewpoint. Um, but this is what we show in the paper. <laughs> but what the scans really look like mostly from a different perspective is like that. Um, because you're seeing that we didn't scan everything, right? We didn't go under the desks. We didn't scan the bottom of the chairs. And you're seeing that the scans actually look pretty bad. Um, so for understanding these scans are pretty good, but the challenge is for like, let's say computer graphics applications, putting them in video games, scanning your home and like, you know, having a game level around it. These kind of things are just not there. It's just not, not even close. Like I'm super excited about these scans, but I, when I show this to my friends who are not in computer science, they tell me that's not good enough, right? It doesn't look great. So the question is how can we make these scans look better? And one of the big questions here is, first, the geometry is a big issue, right? Um, since we're missing so many things, we have a lot of occlusions. And one of the big challenges here is like, can we go from these partial incomplete scans to complete scans? And a very simple idea is we, we formulate the problem as shape completion, right? So we have partial input to a neural network and we train a neural network to predict the rest. And we've done one of these first papers. Again, this is already a few years old here. Um, that takes a partial scan uh, in a form of a sign distance field here as input. Uh, we have a, 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 an encoder-decoder network that predicts a, a low resolution completion, because if you're training this with, let's say, L1 or L2 distance, you will see you get a lot of over-smoothing artifacts. But then what we're doing is synthesizing kind of high-frequency details on top of it to make it look a little bit better. And yeah, the interesting thing from a learning side is this first step here. Uh, we are, we're training a 3D unit here. We're getting an encoder-decoder structure. We have skip connections. In addition, we're using features from a classification network. So we want to use the semantics, which you know, we show that helps to some degree. Um, and we're training this network here end to end. Um, and then at the end of the day, when we're combining this with the high frequency synthesis, you're getting actually pretty reasonable um, results, right? So if this is the input here of a, of a shape, um, this is our completion, and this is the ground truth. Again, input, completion, ground truth, input, completion, ground truth, and so on. So, this one is, um, it's working actually remarkably well, um, given that the input is very partial. Um, but the challenge of course is, well, I talked about 3D scans and what we have done here right now, we ran this on a single shape, which in a sense is a bit boring, right? You don't wanna just do this on a shape, but you wanna do this on large 3D environments. And when I talk about large environments, I mean something like this here. I mean like a 3D reconstruction of, a, of, of literally a whole floor of a building, right? So we see here, these are different rooms. This is one room. I guess this is a couch here, right? And you have a bunch of rooms here. And the challenge you're gonna very quickly realize is, well, these scenes can be damn big, right? If you, like, you don't know even how big they are, every training and every test sample can be of different size. 
So the question is, how do we address these kind of things when we have variable sizes? Um, well, one idea what you could do is you train a network and process things chunk by chunk. Um, it's not so ideal. You're going to end up with seams in the middle. Um, a better way is you, you're using fully convolutional networks. And with fully convolutional networks, um, the nice part is you simply have filter banks in a conf net. And since these are spatially invariant, you can apply them um, at any point at, at test time, right? And for training, you simply train it on chunks. So what we do here is we, we have crops of the scene. This is the partial input of a, of, a, of a chunk. This is the completed output here. Um, and then you're going to uh, train this on a lot of these chunks and you have different augmentations. So you're not like um, biasing it in terms of always oh, only on the wall and so on, but you literally, you randomize that, right? And then you're testing on the entirety of the scene. And yeah, this is a nice thing about fully convolutional networks that, you know, this, this like spatial invariance of the filter kernel is great. And yeah, if you're doing this, we're getting results that look like these ones. So we have here a partial scan as input um, and we, we're training this on synthetic data in this case. So we have synthetic ground truth for these um, 3D environments here that were modeled by, by people. Um, and then we're getting these completed scans and you see, yeah, you, you see like this, this meeting room looks not too bad, right? You see the chairs here, you see the table here. Um, and you see that all the structural elements are also uh, filled in. And the nice thing is, again, since this is fully convolutional, you can do this in a single shot. Like in a single forward pass, you get the whole completion for the entirety um, of this 3D scan. Um, and if you're looking at uh, a video here, it looks like that. Again, this is the input partial scan. Um, this is the completed version of it. And in addition to the completion, you can also predict the semantic labels. Right. You could basically have a separate branch in the head that predicts the semantics. Um, one thing is really interesting. Um, so we wanted to make a case that the semantics, they really help with completion. Uh, we tried this, I think, probably in five or six papers for now. <laughs> it never worked. Um, so semantics don't help the completion, actually. But what actually does help is if you're doing completion and you're learning the structures of the scene, that massively helps the semantics. So whenever you do deep learning tasks, um, Try to consider proxy losses that predict the whole structures as a generative task. So generative tasks always help the discriminative tasks, but never the other way around. It's, it's kind of interesting. Um, and we've, we've tried this on many papers, um, and we always came to the same conclusion. Other people had the same conclusions, actually. So that's very generalizable, actually. In a sense, you, you're trying to learn um, yeah, the, these kind of features. So this one worked actually reasonably well. Um, one problem with the scan complete method, though, is we had to train some synthetic data. And the problem is these are actually synthetically partially scanned scenes. So what we did is we took synthetic scenes, we had a virtual camera, we took partial views of this virtual camera, and then we artificially reconstructed it synthetically, right? Um, it did transfer to real data to some degree because our kind of simulation of synthetic data and, and the real data is not so different, um, but you still have a domain gap there. It's not that ideal. And the question is, what can you do when you don't have this ground truth data? Um, and one idea is you can do self-supervised scan completion as well. And in this case, we thought, well, we're just going to get rid of the entirety of the synthetic data, um, and we only train real data. And now the problem you're going to get in real data, you're going to have a bunch of depth frames from your input, but you don't have all the data. right? You never have a fully complete reconstruction at any point in time. You're never going to have that. Um, but what you can do is you can take all the scans here, so all the frames here in the scan. You're going to get a reconstruction here. Um, and this reconstruction looks OK, right? We had a lot of frames for this one, for this one room here. Uh, but you still see we have a bunch of holes here, right? It's not perfect. So if you took this one here as ground truth, we wouldn't be just right, because our network would learn how to predict these holes. Um, but we can, can do a nice trick here. So what we can do is we can just simply say, well, we have an incomplete scan. And we're just removing a bunch of the depth frames. So instead of having all the depth frames, we're just removing them. And what we do now is we just say, well, we have another input scan here that is less complete. So we have incomplete and then even more incomplete, right? So this is an incomplete scan, and this is a even more incomplete scan. And now what we can do is we can say we correlate these two with each other. We say this is an input scan, and this is the target. This is great, but what I already mentioned is, in this case, our network would actually learn how to predict these holes and stuff like this, which, would be, which is not very desirable. Um, but the nice property of these 3D scans in a sign distance field is, we actually know the pieces that we scanned and the pieces that we didn't scan in this completed version. 
And if you like, if you're familiar with assigned distance functions, right, and you're doing 3D scanning, everything that has a positive sign is actually known space. Because if you have a depth value here, I know everything in front of it is actually empty space. It's like this free space carving. If you're behind the depth value, it's negative in the sign distance field, and then you don't know it. So the trick what we're doing basically, we are, we are in the ground truth data in this target scan, we know what's positive and what's negative. In other words, we know what's observed and what's unobserved space. And what we're doing then in this, in this uh, input to target, we're simply masking out the observed space in the loss functions. And it's very straightforward, right? So what you do is uh, you just check if the sign in the sign distance field is negative, then don't consider it in the loss and everything else that's positive you consider. So everything that was visible and observed you consider and everything else you don't. And this is a very nice version of self-supervision actually, right? So in this case, we don't have actual any ground truth for a single sample, but since we have many training samples, the assumption is that we have seen different combinations of incompleteness, right? Between many, many scenes, we have seen different versions how an object or a room was scanned. Um, so the idea there is we can basically train all of them at the same time, while on a specific sample, we mask out the unobserved regions, our network across the samples will still learn how to get a final complete model. At the same time, we also look a little bit more in the architecture um, because we wanted to generate high, high resolution geometry and wanted to improve that compared to the previous work. Um, in this case, we're going for, for uh, a sparse uh, encode and a sparse decoder. Um, and these sparse encoders and decoders, what they basically do is they're hash functions. So it basically you have, a, you have a, a scan and you're only looking at surface points and around these surface points, you're running convolutions and a hash function tells you whether this convolution has neighbors or not, right? So the neighboring point is just being looked up with a hash, with a, with a hash lookup. Uh, and this is very efficient because memory wise, you don't have to store a full voxel grid, but you basically just store the, um, the, the surfaces around or the voxels around the surface, right? You still have a truncation, right? But you, you don't store everything in the whole 3D grid. And because of that, you can go to very high resolutions. So we have the sparse encoder decoder, uh, right? We have this input scan here, we encode it. Um, and then we have a hierarchical decoder, meaning that we have multiple levels where we have a binary cross entropy on a per voxel basis that tells us in the target, is, it a, is, it a, is, it, is there a surface point or not, All right? Um, and finally, we have here, this is the final prediction that's the truncated sign distance prediction. Okay? Um, and we're training this incrementally, meaning that we'd be training it first with, with that loss, then we're adding these layers, then we're adding this loss, then we're adding this layer, adding that loss. And it's like this course to fine training or uh, course to detail or whatever you want to call it, right? Um, and this works remarkably well. You're basically going to get stuff like this here as input, and you're going to get this here as output. And we're training this in this self-supervised fashion, as I said before. And this is the architecture we're training. And because we have this sparse architecture, we can actually train relatively high resolutions here. Um, so if you're looking at some of the results, um, this is an input scan. And this is the reconstruction that we're getting or the prediction with our network. And you see, it looks actually, it looks quite good, right? Um, compared to what we had before, um, you actually see quite some low, uh, low little details already. Um, so yeah, I think, I don't know. I mean, this is probably state of the art what you can do with, with generative models in 3D scans. Um, it's not perfect yet, but it's at least, um, I think it's a good step towards, you know, what we had before when we ran this on a single shape and or even when we had these always moving artifacts and so on. So yeah, I don't know, it looks, it looks pretty good. Um, we also uh, released the code. Um, so if you wanna play around with these kind of architectures also for other problems, um, I think it works actually remarkably well. Um, also, quantitatively, um, here we're measuring an L1 metric. Uh, we're comparing it against um, a bunch of baselines. Um, this is this SGNN paper that I just mentioned. Um, this was the scan complete what we had before. Uh, this was the chunking based version of the shape completion, also what I mentioned before. This was previous state of the art. And, and this one was like handcrafted post on surface reconstruction. That's probably not the best method here, but we just wanted to show. Yeah, it's like you can do just basically local shape interpolation by optimizing a Poisson field. Um, but yeah, the learning versions now get a lot better, right? So the error goes quite down a bit in terms of the L1 metrics here. And I think that's pretty good. Again, it's not perfect. You still have a few missing pieces. It's and, and some detail is not quite there yet. Um, but compared to what you know, what we had like two or three years ago, we actually made quite some progress. Uh, I wanted to show a few more examples here. Um, um, this here is the input, uh, this here is the target, and this here is ours. And let's have a look at this one here. 
And I mentioned the self-supervision idea, basically masking out the unobserved regions. If you don't do that, or let's say here, this is this version here. If you don't mask this stuff out, the network learns to do something. Basically, the network learns to make this guy here make look like this guy. And this is what the predictions here would look like, right? So here you have a bunch of holes and here it still has a bunch of holes. But we've been masking out the unobserved regions. We're getting actually pretty complete scans here as output, right? So it's, it's very remarkable in a sense that, yes, on one sample, you never have full ground truth. But since you're training it across samples, you're actually getting... Um, yeah, you, you, you're getting better results than in any ground truth sample you ever had. And I think that's really cool. Um, even here, when you're looking at this bathtub here, right? Looks pretty nice. And um, yeah, this is a nice property in, in the sign distance field that you have this, the sign tells you which one is observed and which one is unobserved. Um, and you know, you can get pretty good um, predictions here. Uh, we can also um, measure the varying degrees of the incompleteness that we use for target. Uh, in this case, we have different, um, uh, yeah, th this one here, the different uh, uh, metrics in terms of how, how good we are in terms of the outputs, right? So higher here is, uh, I think, uh, better. Um, and here we have the varying degrees um, of partialness. So we see that it doesn't really matter, actually, like how partial the input-output pairs are. Um, yes, there's a little bit of a difference here, right? But not so much, actually. And I think that's pretty good, right? So it doesn't matter how incomplete it was you're still going to get pretty good predictions. And these are just different metrics. You know, these, these ones here, right? This is the L1 metric on everything. Um, this is the L1 on the unobserved. And this is the L1 on the predicted one. This is the L1 on, on, the, on the respective target, right? So you see, the green one gets a little bit worse. But it's not that much worse compared that you have 50% plus coverage here. And here, you only have like 30 to 50%, right? Um, and I think that's, that's pretty nice, right? Um, so the big question right now is, so I think this, this works pretty well because we're running it on the distance field and for the geometry, we're getting good predictions. But the big question here is, well, now we have the geometry, can we deal with the color? And we also wanted to basically predict textured surfaces and not just the geometry. And we thought, well, this is straightforward. We're just gonna go ahead and for every voxel, we're just, we're just storing an RGB value of the input. And we tried that out, and it worked terribly, actually. <laughs> um, and the one reason why it works so badly is because the color resolution is a lot higher than the geometry. Right? Like storing it in a voxel is a problem. Uh, the other problem you're going to get is uh, the voxels off the surface, it's unclear what color values you should assign there. All right? So it's not so easy to learn that. And so this trick of the self-supervision, how I just mentioned it, it doesn't work so well for the color. And this is one thing we've been working on for a while now. And we still haven't fully figured it out, but we, I think we made some really good progress. Um, and the idea is we're taking this one here as input and we're predicting a 3D scene with a texture as output, right? Um, and what I mentioned, right, the naive idea is we, we can just add the color in the same way um, and, and do this like self-supervision, what we had before. Um, but you have to believe me here that this one is not enough. And the big question is how can we do self-supervision with the color in order to have higher resolutions? Um, and the honest answer is, in 3D alone, you can't do it. It's just not enough to just have a reconstruction here uh, and have some target RGB values. So what we did is, instead of doing it in 3D, we actually have losses in 2D. So what we have here is an input scan. Um, this is our supposed our prediction, right? So I mean, this is, looks actually pretty reasonable, right? It's a 3D scene. It has all the walls now. It has the couch is, is kind of fixed up here and all the rest. Um, but the idea here is, for the color, we don't have any losses in 3D, actually, but we rather render different viewpoints, right? And then we're comparing it with input RGB images. So what we're doing is we do the self-supervision by taking out a bunch of frames in the first reconstruction that we have initially. This is what we're getting here. Um, and then we synthetically render a bunch of views from this 3D scene and comparing the renderings here with RGB image that we also have taken from the same scene. Right? Again, we have not observed the whole scene, but we're trying to take a bunch of the RGB image out from the input and then we're correlating the color that we render with the output. And now what we do in 2D here is, and we have a bunch of 2D losses here to make the colors look sharp. Um, the simplest thing is we have a 2D reconstruction loss. That's just an L1 loss, that's easy. Uh, we're using a perceptual loss that's based on a VGG loss, right? We take VGG features and have this perceptual loss. 
Um, and you also use um, a 2D adversarial loss. We have again, basically, that has a 2D discriminator that tells us, oh, are these images looking like these images? And it's actually a conditional again, uh, because we do this render. Um, and now we have a bunch of 2D losses here um, that tell us, are these rendering looking good? But the question right now is, based on these losses here, we have to, of course, change the 3D predictions, meaning that we have to back propagate from these 2D losses back to 3D. And this is something what we do with differentiable rendering. So what we do is we have a ray caster. We take the TSD of isosurface, we ray cast the geometry. And through this ray casting process, we just know um, for a current point in 2D, we know a loss in 2D, and we know which voxels in 3D are affected by this 2D loss. So based on the ray casting, we know which voxels are affected by the 2D loss, and we get the according gradients based on these losses that we just computed. OK, so it's an end-to-end -end, um, thing. There's actually no learnable parameter in 2D. Um, there's just this, this, this differential renderer that takes the 3D part, projects it into 2D, and then along the ray cast, you know which voxels are affected. Uh, and then you train this across scenes. Um, and it's the same idea. We don't only train in one scene, right? We train across scenes. So we, even though one scene is incomplete, we can still complete across scenes. So this is an input scan here. Um, uh, if you only take an L1 loss, you get the, the standard issues that it's going to be very blurry, right? You see this here, like the floor is not very sharp. Uh, if you're adding the perceptual loss, it looks already a little bit better, um, but also, yeah, not perfect. Um, the, the problem with the perceptual loss is it tends to, to like wash out a little bit the colors and the L1 loss tends to blur out the whole thing. Um, and if you're combining the uh, L1 with the it's very real one. It, it gets a bit more color variety, but it has a bit low level noise. You can't see too much here. Uh, and if you combine all three together, you're going to get actually a relatively nice reconstruction. Um, and yeah, this is the input. And this is our final prediction here as output. Um, again, it's not perfect. Um, you also see that um, the scan itself is not perfect. Um, but compared to the baselines here, or to the ablations that we're doing here, we're getting actually pretty nice um, reconstructions. OK, um, yeah, we tried this on Matterport 3D. That's a data set that we released um, also a few years ago. We compared it against all the state of the art. Um, this is Occupancy Networks, PFO, SGNN uh, on synthetic trained. This is SGNN trained on real. Um, this is our baseline only with the 3D losses. And, and this is now what we're getting in terms of our, our final reconstructions. Um, OK, this is the evaluation on the geometry. So, what we show here is also that the 2D losses of the color also help the geometry, which makes sense, right? You need to change the geometry such that you get better read projections, and that is enforced by this differential renderer. And we show that we're getting also um, better color scene reconstructions. Um, this is a bit of a weird thing because we're using FID scores. Um, everybody who has played around with FID scores knows that these metrics are a bit weird. Um, they're OK. They tell us something. Um, but yeah, the evaluation, of course, with GANs is difficult. Um, but yeah, of course, we're getting better numbers. Um, that's what we need to do when we publish the paper. <laughs> um, and yeah, but it also looks, of course, um, better. So we comparing here. Um, this is, again, the input here. Let's take this example of this couch here. This is the input. And the baselines, basically, they, they wash out the colors, right? And we actually get relatively reasonable reconstructions. Again, not perfect, but compared to the baselines, quite an improvement. OK, um, we also have a nice video, of course. Um, this is our input scan. And this is then our completion with the color that we're getting here at the end of the day. Right, so you see you get now the color reconstruction plus the geometry. And you don't need any, any, any synthetic ground truth. You just need a 3D scan. So you need a bunch of 3D scans. Of course, you need not just one uh, per training. And then you take out frames, right? You have the self-supervision in 3D for the geometry. You have the self-supervision for the color in 2D. We train all of it at the same time. Um, and then we're getting actually relatively good reconstructions. Um, so that being said, um, we're getting good results, but these results are still not perfect. And there's a fundamental problem in this whole like SDF. I like SDFs. I'm a big fan of implicit functions. Uh, there's one problem with if you're running um, sign distance fields plus marching cubes. So it's always like you have a sign distance field, you optimize everything, or you predict everything in sign distance field space. Uh, then you're running a marching cube and getting a mesh. Um, you still always, even though it looks great, right? You, you still have a bunch of always moving on the edges. And one thought that we had is maybe we can tackle the problem from a completely different direction. And we could just say, well, screw all of these, like try to learn how to generate geometry. Let's just take a CAD database and retrieve all it. So instead of learning to generalize, maybe we can go ahead and do retrieval. 
Uh, and retrieval would mean you go ahead and have a 3D scan like this one. Um, and you're going uh, you're gonna to try to retrieve all these chairs and all the tables and align them on top of the 3D scan. Right? So it's a retrieval plus alignment problem. And the hope is that our 3D CAD database is good enough. It has enough variety. Uh, so the downside is we don't generalize. In this case, we're not reflecting the exact same environment that we have in the input, but we're getting a very low poly representation that has like all the sharp features we can possibly put in like video games or AR games and so, right? Uh, so the problem statement, again, we have here a simple part of a scan. It's a chair from a scan. We have a bounding box in this case. And what we want to do is we have a cat model here uh, and we want to align that. The challenge is, if you train a network on this, these things are semantically the same. I, me as a human, I know that these, these two things match, but they're geometrically different, right? Like if you look at this chair, it's not exactly the same chair, right? These handles here, these arms, uh, armrests, they're a little bit different than these ones. Um, so we presented the scan to cat paper, um, um, yeah, about a year and a half ago. Um, and what we're doing there is we basically have a cat database. And what we're doing is we have an input 3D scan uh, we're trying to find correspondences from the input scan to the CAT models. We have a ninth of pulse estimation, and we're trying to align the CAT models on top of it. And we're learning this, of course. So this part here, the correspondences are learned, and this is then an optimization that we do on top of the learned correspondences. And ninth of, it's because three for the rotation, three for the translation, and we also have three dof for the scale. So we allow for anisotropic scaling of the CAT models. Um, well, the biggest problem that we had, we started this project and we realized there's no data set out there. So we first had to create a data set. Um, and this was actually quite challenging because you basically need 3D scans and you need to annotate correspondences uh, between the scans and the CAT database. Uh, so we created the scan to CAT data sets. Anyway, so the idea is, right, we have the scene, right? We have the CAT annotations. We do first retrieval and then we align it. And we have this kind of nice interface here that you see on the, in the web browser. So we have this web interface, right? Uh, we see the 3D scan. Uh, then on the side, you see the models. The user selects which model, and then we select the key points between them. Okay, so this is basically how the annotations go. Um, and um, it might sound simple, but actually to get this right on Amazon Turk uh, and Turk it out, it's actually quite difficult. So we had several annotation passes. We hired a bunch of student helpers and EVs to fix all of these annotations. Um, and we wanted to make sure that we get all the major objects, all the furniture are annotated. Um, at the end of the day, we collected about close to 100,000 key point annotations, about yeah, 14,000 CAD models. Um, and we annotated all the scanned scenes. So we have all the 1,500 scenes in scanned are all annotated. Um, and this data set is now public. It's actually been quite used for, for various tasks already. Um, I don't have the exact numbers here. Um, we released it last year. Um, but yeah, I don't know. We, we are pretty excited because you can do a lot of cool things with that. Um, yeah, and then, of course, now we have the data. Now we had to devise a method. And what we did here is we took a 3D scan. Uh, and with the 3D scan, what we did is we first threw away the color. We didn't want to use that. We just wanted to use geometry in this case. Um, we voxelized the whole thing, so we get a voxel representation. Uh, we're detecting a bunch of key points here. In this case, we're just using a 3D Harris. It's a straightforward key point detector. Um, and then what we do is for every key point here, we are running a neural network. And what we do is we have a key point. We have the crop here of this area. And then for a given cat model, we're predicting where's this point on the cat model. So we're just predicting a heat map where this point could be on the cat model. And we do this for a given CAT model, we do this for every point, right? So now we have the next key point, or oh, this one would be here, the next key point would be here, next key point would be here, and so on. And now we're taking for this one CAT model, for this one chair, we ran this for the entirety of the scene. So we get a bunch of these heat maps. Um, and then we're running uh, a nine of pulse optimization. In this case, we use some genetic algorithm. This was just the most efficient thing um, that worked the best for us. Um, and then we get the final alignment out of it, right? Um, so if we're summarizing this in order to basically get the cat retrieval in alignment for the entirety of the scene, um, for every cat model in our database and for every key point in a scene, we predict this heat map. And then for every cat model and for every set of heat maps, we run a, a nine of pose optimization. So you see already it's quite computationally expensive, right? For every key point, for, 
for every cat model is, is a quadratic term. It's quite something you have to run this, right? So per scene, you get about a few hundred uh, key points and you have maybe at least a few hundred cat models in your database. Probably Shapenet has a few thousand actually, right? Um, so it's quite something we have to deal with. So it's not, it's not super fast, but, but I'll show you a solution later. Um, but the method is actually a lot better um, than just trying to predict key points on cat model and, uh, and the scene independently. So this works actually. So um, these ones are handcrafted features where we compare against. What we care about here is the final number here in terms of the alignment accuracy. Um, this is an accuracy, basically, how many, um, how many of the models did we successfully align? This is what we're measuring here. Um, this is like, um, this is FPFH and shot is from the point cloud library. Um, these are handcrafted features. It's not a big surprise that they don't work so well because the geometries between scan and cat models are different. Uh, this is a method we had before based on the sign distance descriptor, also handcrafted, works a bit better, not much better. Uh, this one is 3D matched. This is a paper we had before. It works reasonably well, um, but the problem is this is like basically detecting key points on the CAD model and the scene independently, right? So it doesn't do this heat map prediction and this doesn't work so well either. So this is trained on our, on our data set, but it, it has a, a, an inferior method in this case. Yeah, and ours works better. So we're better than the state of the art, but out of all the CAD models in the scene, we're, we're successfully learning 31%. So we're better than the state of the art, but we're still not great. So it's still not working, it's still a hard problem because the geometries are different, right? Um, but if you're looking at some of the results, they look, they look reasonable. Um, this is the scan here and import, right? You see a couch here, a chair here, another chair, desk. This is the ground truth annotations in the database. So if you overlay this ground truth here with the scan, this would actually work pretty well. Um, yeah, and this is what we're getting here as predictions, which looks pretty close to the ground truth for the most part uh, of, see, of these scenes. But again, it's, it's not perfect. This is not working for every scene so well. Um, but the baselines work significantly worse, of course. Uh, so this is a good step. Um, here we propose the data set, which is now public. A lot of people are using. Um, we have a bunch of methods around there, um, but there's a bunch of limitations. Um, one of them I mentioned already, which is basically, you're gonna have this issue of runtime. This 10 minute per scene is an issue. <laughs> um, because again, you have to run it for every key point for every cat model, it's one forward pass. And a forward pass is, I don't know, like 100, 200 milliseconds or so, but the sum of all of it is, is kind of the problem, right? Uh, and you try 400 random cat models, it's, it's not super efficient, right? So that's, yeah. I mean, it works well, but it, it, it takes a lot of time. Um, but we thought about how to improve that actually. Uh, we had a follow-up work, um, and I think technically that's that's really it, it's a good improvement. And the idea is we don't do it key point based anymore, but rather we have an end-to-end -end alignment method that does it basically um, on object detection. So what we do here is we take a three scan here first uh, as input. We're running first object detection for every detected bounding box here. We're doing a nearest neighbor lookup in a cat database, um, and then we're predicting for every bounding box we detect we're predicting a set of dense correspondences. I'll get into this detail what these corresponds are actually looking like. Um, and then we're running simply a procrust um, on a per model basis in order to get the rigid alignment between these cat models and each detected object, right? And this one can then be run in a single forward pass. And I'll show you this in a second how it works exactly. Uh, so let's have a look at all the details in terms of the different data we're looking at. Again, we have the 3D scan. We're doing the detection first. We then, for every object, we're predicting a mask what's on the object. This is this one here, like basically object versus background relative to the current mask. Uh, and then we're predicting these correspondences. And we're calling these correspondence uh, symmetric aware object coordinates. So what these ones are doing, uh, these correspondences are dense on the object. So if you're taking one of these voxels on the sofa chair here, we predict, we're mapping simply where would this point in 3D map on the unit cube on the cat model, right? It's just the correspondence. It's just mapping into this unit cube. That's what we call them object coordinates. It's just where would this point be in the object coordinate? Um, and we do this basically for every object, right? And then for every object, we're gonna get a set of correspondences. And then we can use that to align the cat models, right? So here, you know, this, Part here, uh, this part here is on the armrest of the chair, right, and so on. Uh, and then we design an architecture to do all of this at the same time. Um, we have the input scan here. We have a fully convolutional backbone in 3D that's very similar to the other networks for semantic scene understanding, what we've seen before. 
And it's like a mask RCNN version in 3D. Uh, we're having a bunch of object detections and bounding boxes. We're regressing the box sizes. Um, we're getting a descriptor for every box. We're comparing this descriptor with the CAD models in the database. These descriptors are pre-computed. Uh, we have a loss here, how well they match. And then at test time, we take the best matching object. Uh, we're regressing the scale of the object. This is something we do to make the optimization afterwards easier. Uh, and then we're getting these, uh, these dense correspondences here. Um, and we're using these dense correspondences on a per voxel basis. We are having this mask what's on the object versus what's not on the object. And um, we're using these ones then in a, in a progressed alignment in order to get the final error. There's a few things I haven't mentioned here yet, and that makes it a bit more complicated. One thing is, we not only want to predict correspondences. In fact, what we want to do is we want to predict correspondences such that the optimization works best. And the way to do this is we differentiate actually through the whole progress. So we have a loss not only on the correspondences, but we do have a loss on the final alignment. Um, and I'll show you in a second, you can actually very easily differentiate through the progress algorithm. It's very super easy because it's just an SVD and an SVD is a differentiable algorithm. Um, and the other thing we're doing, we're looking at the symmetry. Um, I'm not gonna go into all the details here, but one problem you're gonna have is if you have a round chair, a round table, uh, it, it, you can rotate it, right? So these correspondences have to be unique. And the way we do that is we always make sure it's in a fixed coordinate system relative to the scan alignment. So, if the scan would be rotated, my correspondences would be two, but they would be consistently rotated. And as long as it's consistent, you can still train it and it works. Um, we played around with this a bit, and then we classify basically which symmetry each model has, and based on that, we're doing the right optimization afterwards. OK. Um, yeah, so then for every object, you're going to get correspondences. Uh, we're going to run this uh, 9 of optimization. Another example here, right? Um, again, we're taking these correspondences here. Run a rank it's nine uh, DOF optimization. Uh, and this nine op DOF optimization has a couple of steps, right? Like it's basically the scale first, then you do the translation, and then you do a progress just for the rotation. It's just literally an SVD. So what you do here is you have two point clouds with progress, right? In this case, these are correspondences, and the goal is you find the optimal rotation between those two. So you're trying to solve this term here. Um, and it's Again, this is just an SVD. It's just you build a covariance matrix between the correspondences between the points. You run an SVD, and that gives you the rotation. And the nice thing is the SVD is differentiable um, because it's just a bunch of linear algebra operations, which is super easy. Uh, and that means we can have a final loss on the progress alignment that tells us basically not only which correspondence itself should close to the other correspondence, but it tells us globally to find good correspondences. And we'll show this end-to-end -end alignment works a lot better. Um, so yeah, so this end, this is why we call it end-to-end -end because we differentiate through the whole thing, including the progress solver. So every time we do a training sample, we differentiate through the solver. Uh, so the input scan here is basically uh, detecting the objects, doing object detection, bounding uh, scale regression, it does the retrieval, gets a feature descriptor per box that we look up. Um, it does these um, symmetric object coordinate um, regressions, and then it does the differential progress. And if you're looking at this um, just uh, qualitatively, we see here 3D scan. We see here what the baselines would do. This is what the scan to cat did. And this is what the, this new method is doing. Um, and this is the ground truth. And you see, like in some of these regions here, the new method just works a lot better. Or here in this case, it just works a little bit better, right? Um, we have a few more examples here. Um, yeah, it, it just works a little bit better, right? We are a little bit closer to the ground truth. It's still not perfect in all cases, but it works a bit better. Uh, but the interesting thing is actually this, this table here. This is what we care about. Uh, this is an ablation study of our method alone. It's not a baseline comparison. Um, we're comparing against different variations here. One version is just directly regressing the 9 dot. What you do here is you just run object detection, and for each detected bounding box, regressing the alignment. This works not so well. Like these direct regressions are not great. And the reason why it doesn't work well is you can't consider symmetries very well. So you have a lot of ambiguities actually there. Uh, you can go ahead and have a bunch of different losses here. One loss is we don't even have this correspondence loss, but we just have the final alignment loss after the progress. So instead of directly regressing the correspondences here, 
we are predicting correspondences, but then feeding these ones into a progress and have a final loss at the very end of the day that says do the final alignment. And this is quite remarkable, actually. Like by just having the progress in the pipeline, you're getting a lot better than a direct regression without having this optimization in there. In other words, you're teaching the network kind of, or you're telling the network, oh, you have to, you have to predict correspondences first. I'm not going to tell you what, which ones, but they have to make sure that the optimization works. Um, symmetry is important. If you don't have a symmetry loss, you're getting a lot. Uh, uh, this is basically every loss, but without the symmetry. So this costs you 10%. Uh, and this one here is interesting. This one I think is the most important finding here. This is basically predict correspondences independently and then run the progress optimizer later. Uh, is 15% different than when you do this end-to-end. -end. So this end-to-end -end helps actually really a lot. Uh, and this is a general thing for deep learning stuff. When, when, you, when you're a new PhD student and you don't know what to do, look up classical computer vision architecture, check what algorithms these people have been doing, make it differentiable and put it in a network. Most of the time this works better. Um, and this works massively better here, actually. And it, it, we've tried it already for a bunch of other problems. But anyway, I think here it works remarkably well, and it's kind of cool. Uh, compared to the baselines, it's the same table I've shown you on the other method in the scan to cat before. Compared to scan to cat, we're 20% better. And you know the handcrafted baselines, again, they're, they're pretty tricky. Um, but we're not only better in terms of the absolute numbers. We also a lot better in terms of the timing, because that was actually our main motivation. We didn't like this like infinite loop of over over all key points and over all models. Um, so scan to cat was slow, right? It took minutes per scene, depending on the scene size, of course. And this one is now well, almost real time. It takes like one a half a second to two seconds or so, right? It depends a bit on the scene size, how many objects you've been detecting. So that's pretty cool. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I think that, that's really nice. This is a scene with like 20 objects. It takes 2.6 seconds, right? Seven objects, 0.6 seconds, and so on. Uh, so yeah, I think this is nice. Um, this is fully convolutional. It does retrieval of cat models. Um, it's over 250x faster now and over 90% wider. Um, one challenge is though, you could argue now the scan to uh, the scan to cat like idea. You, you would like to modify the meshes, right? Instead of retrieving the meshes, you could think about generating the mesh directly. Um, and one thing we've been playing around a bit is this like taking graph neural networks to generate the meshes itself or modify the meshes. In this case, we're generating them. We're taking a sign distance field here as input. We have a graph neural network to connect the, the connectivity of the meshes in the hope that we can model the meshes, right? Um, we have two graph networks, one for the edges, one for the faces. We train this whole thing end to end. So we have an input sign distance field here. We're predicting vertices first. We always predict 100 vertices, but we can predict whether this vertex exists. So it's an upper bound of 100 but it can be less. Then we predict with a graph network, we just connect every vertex with every other vertex. And we have a classifier if an edge exists. So there's one loss for every edge. So it's a, it's a graph network, it's graph features for every vertex, and then it predicts whether an edge exists at the end. Then we go to the dual graph of the faces. Um, you just, every face now is a node, and you predict whether every face exists. Uh, and then you get the output match. It's like the scan to mesh instead of scan to cat. Um, and you're getting, yeah, getting reasonable reconstructions. Um, and it looked like input. Um, and this is then the ground truth. Even the ground truth is very low poly. It doesn't scale very well to large, uh, to large models. Um, but it, it's kind of cool that you can predict the meshes directly. There's actually a cool follow-up this, this year um, called Polychain. They do a much better job than we do. They use transformers to do that. Um, and we use standard graph neural network. So you know that the transformers work actually a little bit better if you do it sequentially. Um, but the reason why we wanted to do that is, and the reason why I'm telling you about it, is not to generate the meshes itself. Um, but the thing what we can do is we can combine these two ideas, what I just mentioned. We can combine the cat retrieval with graph neural networks to get, uh, get the scene structures. We call this uh, scene, scene cat. So we're doing the same trick here, except that we accept that we're doing it on cat models. So we take an input scan. We have a cat pool. Uh, we're detecting the object. We're also detecting the object layout. And now we're having a relation graph similar to the previous purple. Now, instead of the face level, we're running this graph now on the object level. Um, and we're running it on the structure of the scene layout. And then we're predicting this whole layout here. So this is the input, and this is the layout now. Um, I'm not going to go into all my details. I'm already running a little bit short in time. Um, but I, I think it's kind of nice that we're not getting only the models independently but rather be considering the whole scene graph at the same time at, and, and also get the structure. 
right? So here we're getting the 3D scan. Um, this is what scan, uh, this end-to-end -end method was doing. Basically, it doesn't have the walls here. Um, and now we're getting also the, the full room structure. We have losses that every object has a relative uh, position and relative alignment. Um, and this helps a lot in the global alignment. So now we're getting, um, yeah, we're suddenly getting globally aligned models that look actually, uh, sorry, globally aligned scenes that looks pretty good. Here's a few more examples. Again, this is the baseline here. Uh, and this is ours where we basically get, yeah, like look at this room here, right? Like now, now it looks like almost the computer graphics model. We don't have the texture here, yet. the texture is still missing. Uh, but for the geometry, it looks reasonable, uh, low poly person representation that you could imagine you could use for robotics tasks or you could possibly use for VR, AR tasks, right? Okay, um, yeah, I'm, I'm of course super excited about the scan, scan to cat direction. Um, I think this is really great. Um, it, it, it's really cool. There's of course still a lot of things to do, right? Learning better fits, like not just the nine DOF optimizer, but maybe having a bit more would be cool. Deformable part model sounds like a cool direction to go. I don't know, I haven't done that yet, but this might be interesting. Um, we have a couple of, of, of projects where we try to learn the modeling itself. So we're trying to use reinforcement learning, basically, um, to figure out how would an artist model these objects on top of a scan. Um, that was an ICCV paper this year. Um, sorry, last year, we're 2021 now. Um, but um, yeah, I don't know. I think this would be, there's a lot of cool things, of course, you can do. Lighting material textures, I mentioned this already, like to make it look cool to make it look nice like a video game. It doesn't have to be the exact same scene, but it has to kind of get the same touch of the scene. And I think that would be cool, right? If you could do this on a phone eventually, like take a bunch of uh, photos of your, of your room and then you know, figure out this virtual model, I think that would be awesome. Um, so what's next? Um, well, I, I like, sometimes when I do talks, I, this is my first slide and I'm gonna tell people, this is what computer vision looks like. Um, so computer vision looks like a bunch of point clouds here. Um, this is from Kitty, I think. This is from uh, LSD Slam. This is from our deformable reconstruction. This is from our bundle fusion. Um, and for three scene understanding, this is OK. Uh, but when you compare it to computer graphics, computer graphics looks a lot better. right? So the, the big question, what we want to do is like this photorealistic reconstruction. right? You want to go from here to here. The big, big question, how to get there. Um, and I think that, that's a really cool area to work on. Um, in this talk, I've shown you how the generative models can do that possibly. Um, there's another direction, which I haven't talked about, but it's also cool, is to say, well, screw it. We can't get better reconstructions. We just change the rendering function. And this is typically under this umbrella of neural rendering, where you say, oh, yeah, OK, we have an approximate input for control. And then you use like a GAN to synthesize realistic viewpoints again to make these kind of things look like these kind of things here. And yeah, I don't know, if you're interested in these areas, I think this is a really cool area. It's like, uh, it's quite competitive though. There's a lot of people in it, um, but it's, it's super exciting and there's a lot of progress and there's a lot of industry application around it, of course. So all the stuff we're doing here, of course, is, is very related to also what big tech players like Google and so on or Facebook are doing in the AR, VR settings. Um, yeah, so this is pretty much the end of my talk. Um, I would, of course, like to thank all the people who did actually the work. Um, I didn't do a lot of work actually. I'm just the guy who's talking about it. Um, so all my students, of course, have done an amazing job in, in, in working on this, um, but also the external collaborators. Um, we are working with very, very many people. Um, it, it's um, in, the, in the modern world of academia, doing stuff alone is not possible anymore. That, that is one thing, one lesson learned. Whenever you see a professor posting stuff on Twitter or Facebook, it's typically not what they did. And same for me. It's not what I did. It's all these people did it. So yeah, um, yeah thanks a lot. Um, I hope we still have a, a few times for questions, and I, I hope we can get a, still a few minutes for discussion. Absolutely. So thank you very much for the presentation. I have some applause for you. I hope you can hear it, that you feel more like in a presentation that you would have done here in Alan. So thank you very much. There are actually quite a few questions. and. I think that what generally what you're doing is, is very inspiring, uh, essentially building these hybrids of deep learning and, and known functions that you can embed. And uh, this is also a direction that is very much pushed in, in medical imaging. So I think there's many things where we can connect in particular. So one thing in particular in X-ray, the rendering is much more easy because it's only line integrals. So <laughs> it's, it's not as sophisticated that uh, as what you have to do here with textures and so on. So um, there are quite a few questions here also in the chat. 
And uh, the, the first one is what you said about the generative and the semantic relationship that you can benefit from generation and classification, but not so much in the other direction. Do you have any, any clue why, why that is the case? I mean, yeah. probably um, hard to give a formal proof, but I think any mm -hmm. insight would be very helpful for our audience because mm -hmm. quite a few people are working with these methods. And I, I think that's a fantastic question. And, and this is a thing we've been we've also been dealing in for a long time. Um, so the one thing I can say, if you're learning structure, you it's known that you get good features. And the completion basically, or any generative model has to learn structure and it forces you to learn also larger contexts. Uh, and you can see that if you're looking at the activation functions, you see um, that the output is basically dependent on a lot of input pixels or input voxels, whatever you do. If you do completion in 2D images or in 3D, it's both the same. Um, and because of that, you're getting very strong features. Um, and these features, they generalize to semantic tasks, right? So this is the reason why geometric completion or generative models in general can produce in a possibly even unsupervised way, very good features that you can use for fine tuning later on in order to get good um, semantic results. So that's the good news. Um, the bad news is semantics doesn't help the other way around. And I think there's a very easy answer to that, actually. And this is a sad answer, because that means our networks are much stupider than we think. Um, because what I think what a standard ConfNet is doing, you're basically running local feature extractors, let's say on an image, right? You have an image, you're running local comps. Each of the pixels at the end of the day gets a local feature from the, after the first layer, right? You get a feature map. And in a sense, what you're doing when you do classification you basically at some point pool these features. So in a sense, you're kind of doing a majority vote. Oh, I've seen these kind of patterns and these kind of patterns lead to this one class. So when we're talking about semantic understanding as a human, when I'm thinking about semantic understanding, I'm thinking about a 3D representation and I'm thinking about how this part and that part connects and, and so on. Or when I think about functionality, when I think about some tool that I have, like I think about a car, it has tires, the tires, they rotate, right? And so on. But when you're training a network, it's not doing what, it's not what the network is doing. The network is literally just getting low level features and then it's aggregating them in one way or another one, either pooling based or conf based architectures. And then it's reaching a decision based on some, well, majority vote is maybe the wrong term, but it's, it's kind of that, right? Um, and the reason why I'm saying this is bad news, it means we're not really doing a great job at understanding scenes, images and whatsoever, right? And this is why from when, when people tell us, oh, AI is taking over the world and we're better than humans and stuff like this, this is why we're very far from using these kind of things. Um, even to channelize across tasks is very difficult, right? Um, and yeah, I think, I don't know, I feel, I think in my opinion, it would be great if, I don't know, I think, I think people learn differently. You have two eyes, right? You do stereo reconstruction and you're looking around and this self-supervised representation learning that you're getting from the environment, this translates very well. Um, and yeah, images is, is a real pain, right? You can get amazing results with 2D continents, but you need a lot of data to train them. And, and, and especially when I mean, you guys, you, you're dealing with like, I don't know, how, many, how much data do you have for a standard medical image segmentation task? It's, it's just very little data you have available there, right? So you have to be very cautious, like how to do the right augmentations, how to do the right fine tuning, how to do the right pre-training. Um, and transferability is even worse, right? Because like all of the scanners are different. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's just a very difficult problem domain. And so I think globally speaking, the computer vision community is in a bit of a local minima, right? We engineered the hell out of these big continent architectures where we might have to take slightly different routes, you know, to get more domain knowledge in it. Like 3D is a good understanding, physics understanding, motion, right? All these kind of things that are currently missing in deep nets. Um, yeah, and that's why I think um, it's a bit of a sad news, but, um, you know, we have some ideas possibly how to address it. I mean, you can also see this is why we integrate so much prior knowledge, uh, because the solutions found by the networks, if you don't integrate conf layers, they would just link directly pixel input to outcomes. And then they suddenly get very uh, acquainted or, or they get affinity to noise and stuff like that. If you use the same camera over and over again uh, for the same object, then it's more likely that you learn the noise than yeah. the actual object, just because they they like pixel features and you have to embed something that incorporates the, the spatial surrounding by convolution in order to make it work. 
So I absolutely agree with, with what you've been saying. And this it's is a huge opportunity for us researchers in every domain, actually, right? I mean, like addressing these kind of things, um, that, that's the next big thing, right? Like you don't, like adding another layer to another existing content and get like 0.5% more performance is not so interesting. But like thinking about adding this domain knowledge, that's the real key. Yeah, and how to get this together? I mean, uh, if you look at the complex structures that you also shown in your presentation, it's like a kind of, you could argue, neural program that you're setting up where all steps are essentially differentiable and you have parameters that can be tuned from data. But you kind of give the, the knowledge by the construction of the network and their respective losses. You can maybe argue that some losses act as interfaces because you want specific layers to have specific purposes. So I also wonder whether we need some, some kind of neural software engineering and design patterns and stuff like that for the, the kind of programming languages that we are currently developing. But, but it's more like that we're currently in the state of assembler than a, a C++ or, or a high level <laughs> programming language. Uh, yeah, very, very, very interesting. And I'm, I'm completely in line with what you just said. I, I completely agree. So uh, but something that also came up here, and I want to summarize one or two questions here is, um, when you when you work with textures, um, how, how I, I think in particular in, in computer graphics, uh, also the light modeling is a, is a huge thing that you have the light location. And in some of your results, it seems that the light source positioning is somehow encoded into the texture. And yeah. I, I wonder if there's if there's good ways how to how to model that, incorporate that, because then you can also learn from shading and stuff like that. Yeah, indeed. Um, very good question. Um, so, yeah, I mean, at the moment, we don't care about, sorry, these works at least, what we've done here, we, we ignore it, right? And, and this is, of course, wrong. And we know that. We're well aware of it. Um, the problem is already so difficult to even get, like, high-resolution textures to be predicted that, in, that bake the light in. Um, but, yeah, like, it, it's not great because we can't do real lighting. Um, if you're doing AR applications, you want to do real lighting. If I insert a new object, that shadow should be reflected in the rest of the scene. Um, it's very difficult. So in computer graphics, right, there's different lighting models. You can go ahead and have a point light source, an area light source, directional light source, all of these kind of things. And the challenge with these things is they are super hard to optimize. If I have, like, let's say I have a scene, just it's a discrete problem. It's a discrete optimization problem. How many light sources do you have alone? It's just, it's just really hard to optimize this inverse problem. It's just so damn non-convex. <laughs> and, um, and that's tricky. So people in vision have tried approximations of it, sort of harmonics representations, smooth representations of light. That's what people use. Um, and you can combine these kind of things with shape from shading techniques. We've done that too. We have a couple of works around that. Um, but these lighting representations are not, not great. They're, they're not that great. They're good for faces. They work really well, right? For like, a, like our video stream, it would work perfectly to have sort harmonics. You know, I can model like, I have small aesthetic geometry. Okay, I move a little bit, but that's it. The light is static, the camera is static. That, that's dual spherical harmonics. Um, but if you want to go ahead and um, yeah, do this on a larger scale, like a room, then it's much harder. Um, and there's been a couple of papers that, that try to model this now with neural networks, basically, right? So you've met like, the radiance field works that came out recently. These kind of papers try to do that. Um, the challenge is, Learning that from data is very difficult because ground truth lighting information is very hard to come by. Like, I don't know, like, I mean, there's the, the closest one to that is basically using light stages. These are like, they have like a dome and you have like 10,000 LEDs around it and you can kind of like um, control the LEDs one by one and have independent control. Um, that works well. So, but then you can only estimate light for whatever is in, in this one in this one uh, area. And people do this for movies and so on, right? So if you have an actor, you put the actor in a light stage, um, you have all these combinations of light sources, you can learn that you can simulate that. Um, but doing this on a scene level and getting ground truth lighting is just, even the ground truth is so difficult. I mean, how do you annotate ground truth light sources? I mean, if we're looking at my room right now, I have, <laughs> I have a lot of lights here. I have monitors, I have the ceiling lights, I have windows. The windows I can't even reconstruct. I don't even have geometry for it. I can't even annotate. So I think that's super interesting as a problem statement, but um, the future there is clearly neural representations. You want to go ahead and, and encode the light in, in some sort of implicit function. And then for a point in space, you know roughly where light's coming from. That's the trend at least right now. 
Um, the question is how to train it, how to learn it. That's a lot harder. So, but yeah, I mean, it, it's always going to be a very tricky question how to decouple like light, lighting, shading, right? And, and, and texture information, of course. Um, yeah, very challenging. Um, and especially since the ground truth data is hard to come by. Absolutely. Yeah. So this is a lot easier in, in medical because that you typically have one source of photons in an X-ray source and that is yeah. very well known and you know all the physics and you know the noise and so on. So and then you don't have hopefully not that many materials in the patient. So that's that's yeah, awesome. that's really seen it's crazy. Right? I mean think about it, all the material is all the, think about your background right now. You have a bunch of Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's crazy. Yourself. Yeah. And, <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, much more sophisticated than, I mean, after all, you, you do a specific setup for the medical acquisition in the first place, and you can restrict, uh, you you strip off metals from the body and so on, because they would introduce artifacts. So that's, uh, that's a very, very different application. Um, Absolutely agree. So when, when brings us to the question of generalization, uh, and I think this is, this is super tough because what you've shown are essentially living and office scenes. Uh, what, how, how would you feel is, is the generalization of these methods to, to other scenes? Um, mm. General indoor scenes, is that, is that feasible or? Yeah, good question. So, so one thing is um, what, what, what we, I mean, I'm originally a graphics guy, right? Like I, my dream was always, oh, can we render all of this stuff and train everything on the rendering and then everything works in real life. Um, so for RGB images, training a synthetic RGB and doing the tr domain transfer on, on images is not working at all in the whole community. It's just difficult. Um, doing it on geometry works a lot better because you can simulate the noise a bit better, the sign distance representations you can kind of get right. So even if you have only synthetic scenes and then test on real scenes from like connect style data or even multi-view stereo data, um, this one works relatively well, actually. It's, it's not perfect, but it does something reasonable. Uh, the question you mentioned is, is like the generalizability across environments. Mm -hmm. um, it, it is surprising that the generative models work to some degree. And the reason why they work is because you're basically learning geometric primitives. Right, so like sharp edges, walls, and stuff like this, flat planes, and these kind of things, you, you can generalize. This one works relatively well. So the things we're mostly training on is like um, indoor scenes. We're not training only in offices. Um, we also have in our data sets, we have living rooms and stuff like this. Mm -hmm. So covering a reasonable, oh, IKEA is a good. We went to IKEA a couple of times and scanned IKEA. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> we could only kicked out once of Macy's, but I IKEA was very happy with this. <laughs> <laughs> but we did ask actually, so they were okay. Um, anyway, so yeah, like um, the, the generalizability is actually all right. Like uh, across indoor environments, it's okay. As soon as you go outdoors and have different scene structures, then it gets a lot different. That, that one fails, of course, completely, right? Like if you have suddenly a tree and like these leaves and stuff like this, you, you just don't have. But within, within indoor environments, I would say it's relatively okay. Um, Layout prediction, that one is a bit more tricky, right? That depends, of course, on what types of rooms you have. But the low-level geometry, like sharp features, edges, like just verdicts and face distributions, that one is actually not too bad. It's, mm -hmm. it, this is surprising that this works. But in fairness, our data sets are also reasonably big. So Scanlon has about 1,500 scenes. Uh, Metaport, um, it's, about 100, it's about 100 houses. But these houses are really big houses. So it's like 2,500 rooms or so. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you're taking all the combinations of these ones already, you're getting quite some, some variety actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But then they probably have the, the standard layout of Western society, right? So if oh, yeah, if, fully with you, so East that one is, Asian that's what context. I'm saying. Like the layout is hard to generalize if you don't have it in your data set. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, still, but you could probably extend it quite easily because, um, it's the same method that would be applicable. Uh, Method-wise, yes, but, it, but I'm, it, I'm you're raising an important question, right? The question is, if you have different styles, do we know what's roughly going on there? Yeah. I'm super envious about how you can share data. Uh, this is this is really great that you can just scan rooms and, and put them onto the internet. Uh, it's not as easy with medical data. <laughs> there are some big databases available now, so that's actually a big uh, effort, a big advance. But this is this is really great about computer vision that you can share these data and you can just download photographs from the internet and stuff like that. So this is 
And yeah. there's still privacy concerns too. It's pretty funny, like for scanning, we just ask people whether we could scan their homes and they're okay, some of them. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> you have to ask YouTubers. Um, they, they probably allow you to scan everything and, and they sell it as a room yeah. tour. They would probably be interested in the 3D model that, that they could do animations and stuff. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, of course, I mean, this is a general problem, right? Getting data is always a, I mean, you see it also in some of our works. Whenever we, we starting, and again, this is probably also good advice for PhD students who is just starting out. If you're starting a PhD, you want to tackle a problem. And one of the first things you, you probably do is you start with a good data set, right? And, and, and it's a local minima. Um, if you're willing to spend the effort in making a data set, you're overcoming typically the local minima. Right. I mean, but don't get me wrong. I know it, it costs a lot of money. It's, it's not cheap. Like all of these data sets, they cost a lot of money, right? Like hiring people to annotate it is not cheap. The, and the first rule of data collection is if you collect data, you run into problems. And if yeah. you collect more <laughs> data, you run into more problems. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's good, right? If you're exploring new areas, um, I'm always a big fan. I'm not a big fan of just replicating existing data sets and just incrementing it. But I'm, I'm always a big fan of like, oh, this is a new task. And then the academic contribution is more like what specific data do you need and how to design it to get an efficient data? Uh, absolutely. This is, this is often underestimated how much uh, thought and, and manpower, and, but also science goes into designing a good data set and uh, getting the right categories, getting the right geometric information and so on. So this is uh, often underrated, but... It's, it's really important to advance the field, in particular sharing the data afterwards. So, yeah. And I have a question about the, the scan to CAT. Is, is, this, is this all real data, the 1,500 uh, rooms? And, and you, you manually aligned, where did you get the matching CAT sets? Is this all IKEA mm -hmm. or? So, so the, the scans are from Scanet. These are, this is basically, we went around, I don't know if you know the structure sensor, that's like a small Kinect kind of attached to an iPad. Mm -hmm. So this is about 1500, uh, 1500 scans that we've done. And we scanned, of course, we scanned all the universities, right? Mm -hmm. We scanned offices in universities, scanned our homes. We knocked at people's doors, we went to dorms. Uh, we scanned door rooms, like anything. We had a bunch of, this was still in at Stanford, actually. We have Erlangen, too. We have a bunch of rooms from Erlangen. My old office is in the scanning database. For <laughs> it's kind of cool. Um, and yeah, anyway, so we scanned a bunch of stuff. So this is how we got the three scans. We had the bundle fusion reconstruction to reconstruct them, so align the process. Um, so it's quite a pipeline behind it to actually get good stuff there. And in Scanet, we annotated the semantics. So there we basically, we did first an over segmentation on the scan and on a per segment basis, we assigned instance IDs. Uh, and that was actually very painful. <laughs> mm. that, that cost a lot of money and we had to spend a lot of time fixing it ourselves too. Mm. And, and then for scan to cat, we had the cat models. Um, these are from a shape database, um, ShapeNet. This is one of the big databases there. It's like 55,000 shapes. Um, they were scraped from the internet basically that were available. Um, and these are the people from the ShapeNet guys. They already spend a lot of time categorizing it, making sure the meshes are reasonable quality. Um, and then what we did is we took ScanNet and ShapeNet and we, we did this alignment procedure, right? So we figured out, um, yeah, first we, had, we retrieved the models and we did the key point annotation, then we checked it and we had another verification pass. And if that's not good enough, they had to do it again and so on. Um, yeah, and this one also, it cost a lot of effort, a lot of time, but I, I think the quality is pretty good actually. Um, so we are super happy about it. And now you got these ground truth annotations and correspondences basically. But then it's it's one instance from from uh, ShapeNet each that is assigned and yep. uh -huh. exactly. Oh, yeah. but that's that's already super much work. Uh, it's a lot of work. I mean, I I mean, you could argue whether the annotators got the best one, but we had several verification passes basically to figure out the, the retrieval is fine. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a lot of work. This was actually I thought this was a lot easier. But well, you just have a three D mesh and you just drag the model over it. But the problem is you have to tell this to novice users on Turk such that they can use it. So it's a web interface, right? And then yeah. they just have key points. And the next, so first annotator group just does retrieval. The next annotator group does key point annotation, right? Um, and then the next group does verification of both. And, and then you iterate. So yeah, it took quite a while, but it, I think it's cool actually. I, I don't know. I mean, like there's just so many projects that use it right now. Um, 
you know, for like, you can do shape completion suddenly, you can predict the things that were missing, you can do better sure. detection and sure. so on. And sure. Yeah, no, it's, it's nice. Yeah. Very valuable data and many things you can do with that. I have a, a question about the, the graph, uh, scene graph, graph scene, how, how, how did you call mm -hmm. it? Um, what, what's actually the edge information? Is this the, the distance to the object or? Mm -hmm. So we use, a, we use a couple of features there. Um, we use the relative alignment. Mm -hmm. So literally the full pose, mm -hmm. um, including the distance, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also append the per object feature encodings. Okay. So right, so you have the detection, you take the objects. For every detected object, you get an embedding vector, and that vector you correlate. Uh, you, you just append the two from the both nodes that correspond to one edge. Okay. Okay. Um, and then we we ran uh, the GCN um, uh, architecture and uh, in combination with a message passing, mm -hmm. and then we um, we run a bunch of rounds of message passing, and then we're going to get um, some reasonable features, hopefully. And we can show that by having these proxy losses, then saying, oh. We should reflect the distribution of relative alignments. Um, this one works reasonably well, actually, mm -hmm. right? Because you get additional global scene constraints now for the per object alignments. Mm -hmm. um, like often when you look at like the standard like scan to cadre, so you see that you have like like what's, what's super obvious for humans. You have like a flat plane for the floor, and then the, the chairs just tilt a little bit. <laughs> and these kind of things we got mostly rid of this way, right? Because um, you have these pairwise losses between the objects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, and then there's all, the whole domain of, of neural rendering. And I, I know you're also doing a lot of work there. That That's also super interesting. But I guess we need to invite you again for another presentation <laughs> about the neural rendering at some point. Because yeah, we can do that too. I'm, Hopefully in person. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, um, I... I didn't want to talk about neural rendering again. I had a bunch of invited talks recently. I talked about neural rendering and forensics last time. So I thought this time I wanted to do something else. And I think there's a, there's a strong correlation with the medical image domain right now. Okay. Um, especially like what architectures are reasonable, right? This is just what representation you're going to use. Hmm. Um, and yeah, but neural rendering is of course amazing. I'm, I'm a really big fan of it. I mean, but there's a high level question, right? Do we have to do better reconstruction or do we have to do a better job at rendering the imperfect reconstruction? <laughs> I mean, we, we'll meet in the middle probably at some point, right? But where the middle is, we don't know. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, thanks again for taking the time for, for being here, at least virtually. It, it would be great to welcome you in person also at some point. So let's let's hope this will be possible again at some point this year. So it's 20, 2021. So um, we should be able to, to meet at some point again. I hope so. <laughs> and, uh, I, I would like to share another round of applause for you. Just because I love this feature. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. so thanks for attending our seminar and yeah, looking forward to meeting you in person again soon cool yeah thanks a lot take care guys as you have seen there have been many questions to matthias we could ask some of them directly during the presentation and of course you may have many more questions as he announced matthias is very active on social media so you can either ask him directly there or you could also send me a message and i would forward it to him such that it can be answered and of course you can also use the comment functionality under this video to ask your questions i would also forward them to matthias so Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the presentation and I'm very much looking forward to welcoming you again very soon for the next presentation in Beyond the Patterns. Bye bye. <laughs>